All right, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, I'm Emily Morphy, so I'm the Sales Director at Tubular. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, we're the, the global leading measurement company for social video. Uh, so we, we track all public video um, data and audience consumption behavior across YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitch. Um, and yeah, we're, we're essentially trying to be a Nielsen or Comscore for those platforms. Um, so that's one of the reasons we sponsored the, the session today and why this topic's so interesting for us. Uh, but yeah, the plan for this session, so we're going to be looking at um, really the role of a commissioner in the, the digital era and how that, that's changed over the last few years. Uh, so I will introduce the panelists. Um, and yeah, I guess starting with uh, James, we have from Channel 4 here. Um, so James, yeah, is responsible for running and overseeing all of Channel 4's social media output. Uh, he's been with them since 2014. And yeah, I guess some of the highlights. Um, so yeah, he's been responsible for helping grow E4 to be one of the largest um, yeah, TV broadcast channels on Facebook in terms of viewership, which is amazing. Um, and then it has also been involved in campaigns such as Derry, uh, Girl season two. Uh, then Alex we have from Endmore Shine, uh, he's a head of insights, um, so really is responsible for um, yeah, looking at audience research, distributing that across the, the company, and I think they're, they're working in over 20 markets. Um, and yeah, before working at Endemol, um, Alex is also at, at uh, Cantal Media Group and Barb. Um, and then Nikki we have, um, who's the head of factual and factual entertainment at Sky Vision. Uh, Sky Vision's, yeah, it's essentially the distribution arm for Sky and seem to be part of Sky Studios. Um, but yeah, you've been involved in, in acquiring titles such as, um, yeah, Secret Life of the Zoo, Escape to the Chateau, Reported Missing. Um, and then finally, we've got David here, um, who's the director of planning at Twitter. Um, yeah, is really responsible for helping users, media companies and organizations use Twitter data. Um, and also, I think as well as being here for the festival, you've um, actually got your own Twitter exhibition that you launched, right, today, yes. if I'm not mis mistaken. Scottish Twitter. Yes, so exhibition. visit. Visit, visit Scottish Twitter. Um, 21 Blackfriars Street, open 10 a.m. till 8 p.m. It's open, <laughs> it's free, five days yeah. until Sunday. You should go and see it, honestly, it's really hilarious. Yeah, so if you're here for a few days, check it out. Um, <laughs> terrible plug, wasn't it? But, yeah, uh, terrible really plug, like... had to get it out. Um, but yeah, so I think if we, to kick this off, um, James, I know I just sort of talked about the success you've had with E4 um, on Facebook. And um, yeah, I guess you've had so much, like I've seen many, many Channel 4 assets um, have tremendous audiences that you've grown across Facebook and YouTube. So yeah, it'd be really interesting for, for the audience to hear, I guess, how you've been able to build that. Um, but also, yeah, how, how you're then measuring the success of that and the impact that's having on other platforms. So yeah, potentially for TV viewership and for your VOD player. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, it's important to start with the fact that most of what we put out, in fact, almost all of what we put out is taken directly from the television programmes that, that are commissioned for TV. So that's, that's, we've got really great shows to start with. Uh, and then my team's role is quite straightforward. Essentially, we take those bits and make them work on the platforms that we're going to publish them on. Uh, on Facebook, we make videos of a certain duration and make them square and uh, all the rest of it, just to help things uh, get watched and distributed as, as widely as possible. So if, if like, we're trying to work out what to make for uh, for those platforms, uh, I think uh, a lot of commissioners that you speak to, the, their initial response to social media or, or digital distribution is that they don't understand uh, it, or, or maybe they're a little bit uh, nervous around it. But actually, they've been making the content that has been most viewed on those areas of the internet for the last sort of five, ten years anyway, because it's it's telly that is driving those mm -hmm. those bits, those platforms. Those, I mean, YouTube. You, it's not actually YouTubers that are getting watched on YouTube. It's, uh, it's TV content that has been made for, uh, made to fit on that platform. So that's that's what we do, um, and we're good at it. I think um, people keep watching. Um, and uh, how do we analyze the performance? I mean, it's that's uh, yeah. You're limited, I think, by the data that's available. There's loads and loads of data. Um, but there's loads of data that you don't need, uh, and there's not a lot of data that you do need. Um, so, like, it'd be really important for us to to know specifically, uh, like, uh, individual reach um, across multiple platforms. Uh, are we reaching the same people, or 
are we reaching additional numbers uh, by, by being present on other platforms? And we can't do that at the moment. So, and then, and then there's the problem that, um, apologies, but uh, I think it's not, not so much you, more some of the other platforms, but some of the data's wrong. Um, so, um, yeah, it wasn't supposed to be this kind of conversation, sorry. Um, but, uh, to be clear, definitely not Twitter. Yeah, it's not you, it's not you. Um, so, yeah, uh, but, but I mean, the data that is available, you know, uh, what's doing well, it's quite, it's, it's, it's easy enough to see what's doing well, and then you do more of what's doing well and less of what's not. Yeah. But, but it's, you need to be clear of what it is that you're hoping to measure at the start. Yeah, and I guess with, or if we take something like the Inbetweeners, um, yeah, or, or many of your shows, have you have you ever been able to model out like the impact having that that Facebook presence has led to, to viewership on your VOD? I mean, there's a, certainly VOD, we've seen the increased, uh, increased UK viewing has uh, correlated to increased incremental VOD viewing mm -hmm. on, on all four. Um, but there's obviously it's it's a lot harder to track the impact of of something over here on a digital platform and linear viewing. So we we we're, we've got some tests at the moment. Yeah, it goes but well, is I'm it? Sure I guess is it a priority? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And is it a priority to try and figure out that that correlation? Yeah, what well, to work out what yeah. makes people watch telly? Yeah, I would <laughs> say so. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. And then Alex, from yeah, looking at some of the the projects you've been part of at Endmall, um, yeah, have you been able to see where there has been a, a much larger presence on social, sort of the impact? Um, yeah, in, in other areas for that. Yeah, I think there's this kind of perceived wisdom that um, sort of distributing your content on um, YouTube, Facebook, or these other uh, and other sort of platforms will sort of cannibalise uh, the linear audience, and we've kind of found that to be uh, not the case. I mean, we've got numerous case studies. Um, Nielsen have even done some research with YouTube, which is kind of publicly available. But we've got a show. Um, it's not UK focused, but one um, in Spain called Operacion Triumfo, I think I've pronounced that right. And um, that's basically the Spanish version of Fame Academy. So if you remember David Schneiden and um, uh, Lamar and all of those people, um, they brought it back in Spain, uh, the latter part of 2017. Um, and it'd been off air for like six years. And the broadcasters were really, really keen to make it sort of uh, attractive to younger viewers. So um, they actually decided to have this whole 360 approach to um, across all um, social uh, and hopefully drive that younger audience, which had been lost, uh, back to the channel. And it, it, it worked remarkably well. Um, we were delivering billions of views um, across the whole series um, just on the live stream. And um, sort of James mentioned, we actually could track the uh, linear viewing, particularly among those sort of 16 to 24 year olds actually increase. So it was um, a, a really great experiment. And, and, and there's other examples. And we're hoping that we can actually roll that model out um, in the UK, particularly as mm -hmm. well now. So um, yeah, it's encouraging. Yeah, amazing. Um, and then I guess for, from your perspective, David, yeah. are you finding uh, the way that, yeah, that broadcasters or media partners are using Twitter data? Has that, that changed? Yeah, I think so. I think basically people have got over the sort of cannibalization fear that uh, you know, Alex touched on. I think maybe two, three years ago, people would go, well, you know, we don't want to stop them watching it by putting it up mm -hmm. on social media or whatever. But that conversation has kind of gone away because people have recognized that essentially, it's just great sampling, isn't it, for your great mm. content? I mean, even you know, Coca-Cola do sampling extensively and everyone knows what it is and stop people buying the products. Um, so on a very simple level, you're just marketing to or showing your content to an audience who we know are really hungry for TV content. We know they love it. You know, 200 million tweets sent about telly every year. Yeah. Um, and more to the point, they're coming to Twitter to discover and see what's happening. So yeah, that discovery mindset, you know, again, I don't want to number wang you, but we did some research, found that 65% of, of all Twitter users in the UK had found uh, out about TV content through Twitter, found mm -hmm. something to watch through Twitter. I'm only surprised it's that low because, you know, you kind of go mm -hmm. on Twitter and, and all the great sort of content that gets shared and gets talked about. So actually, I think the, the industry's sort of grown up and recognised that people are watching in different ways, catch up as much, mm -hmm. yeah, much more of a thing. Obviously, Netflix has changed the way people view stuff. Yeah. So people are kind of embracing 
embracing that wonderful kind of messiness of how social and TV now interact. Mm -hmm. We're definitely finding that. Yeah, amazing. And I guess then thinking um, where social video actually plays, and maybe this is more for you, James, into the, I guess, your marketing mix. Yeah, how, how important is, yeah, is video content on the social platforms compared to other ways of, yeah, you know, speaking to your audience? Well, uh, so it depends on the type of audience that you're trying to reach, but social audiences are younger than our telly audiences. So if in a world where I think I think it's safe to say telly viewing amongst younger audiences is in a bit of decline, um, if we're reaching fewer people with our on-air uh, marketing, then we need to reach them in a different way. So where are they? They're on, uh, they're on, I mean, I know it's not as young as it used to be, but they are on Facebook uh, in massive numbers. Um, they're on Instagram and they're on, they're on, there's an enormously loyal section of them on, on Snapchat. So that's why we've launched um, a, uh, a, a Snapchat um, uh, operation very recently with Celebs Go Dating to so some great uh, success. Um, yeah, so, nice. so it's very, it is really essential uh, if we can't get them otherwise. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, if you do it well, and you've got content that's really good and spreads organically, then that's, that's low cost. It's really, really low cost as opposed to um, spending money on, on, on media. Yeah, great. Um, and I guess, um, yeah, thinking this from another perspective, um, and maybe, yeah, Alex, you might have some examples here, but um, have there been times where you've been able to use any of the, the platforms to really test different IP and um, yeah, different ideas you have at a, a relatively low low cost? Yeah, um, there's a few actually. So when we first sort of set up the digital side of uh, Endemol Shine Group, um, one of the main reasons for it was IP protection. So through claiming, we went through our vast amount of catalogue and we've got 66,000 hours of content. So um, we've tried to claim that. Um, we know or we, we've actually um, claimed a large proportion of that. So uh, what we tend to do is we actually leave that there. We don't remove it. We let it sort of live on the platform and, 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 and see kind of who watches it. Um, and we've seen a huge amount of uh, interest in some of these uh, archive shows, really. So um, Snog Marry Avoid, which was on BBC <laughs> Three. Um, it's got a huge level of engagement on um, on YouTube, and we've actually built um, a, a channel um, which is exclusively uh, made up of that type of content. And um, we've got around five hundred thousand subscribers, which is which is quite a lot. Um, so yeah, there's, there's there's definitely ways that we can look at this sort of archive content and then try and bring it to the fore. And then you know, we're talking about commissioning here, but um, we can then sort of empower the uh, local operating companies you know, with this information and then maybe when they have discussions with broadcasters they can say well did you know that there's this dormant audience for this particular show um, and, and, and nostalgia is really really important people love nostalgia so um, yeah it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's just really the tip of the iceberg at mm. the moment. Interesting. Yeah, Nikki, are there any, I know you're coming at this from a, a different perspective, yeah, but have you seen any examples like that where some new IP has been able to be tested on digital and then that's actually been brought, yeah, to, to linear? Um, hopefully, absolutely. From a, a distributor's point of view, um, we have a very close working relationship with a production company called Spark Media Partners. Um, they make Escape to the Chateau for Channel 4. Um, so they've always been traditionally linear, but um, recently they've worked with um, Calix, who's uh, quite a big YouTuber influencer in the UK. I think he's got three million subscribers. And together they created a half hour show, um, game show called, uh, now I've gone blank, Gate Masters. And uh, so there we go, it's probably not called that. But um, it's had 1.7 million hits. It's been brilliant. That's great proof of concept for then Spark to go to a commissioning editor and say, look, you know, this is a game show. It's had this much in, um, interest. And also YouTube, you know, you get all the, the comments, positive and negative. So that's, that's a really interesting mm. model for them to, to follow. Yeah. Do you find that it's also useful to have that data from like a, a sales perspective as well? The day, what the the hits? Yeah, yeah, and see, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, it is proof of concept, and I think everyone's just going to have to change the way they view new new content on linear. Uh, for us internationally, um, getting all that, you know, the 
the talkability that you get through social media and social video is a great sales tool for us. And, and yeah, it's, it's very appealing to broadcasters yeah. across the globe because it brings that buzz. Yeah, nice. Um, and then I guess also thinking around, um, not just like testing your IP, but yeah, being creative and how you guys are, are using these platforms. Do you, have you had examples where maybe you've been able to do like great behind the scenes footage or yeah, you've tested other, other types of formats on, on these platforms that have done yeah, worked well for that, that show? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any like, um, yeah, that come to mind? Yeah, being... so um, there's loads of ways of doing different types of content on there, and they're all good in different ways. Um, I think one of the things that we learned quite early on was uh, that when Facebook are trying to push a new product, um, they push it really hard and they give it sort of algorithmic advantages uh, so that it gets served to more people just to try and make people, uh, publishers use it. Um, but then that algorithmic advantage disappears and that part of the product becomes pretty much just like everything else. And uh, the, uh, so, so sort of, beware of um, over investing in gimmick products mm -hmm. but I mean there's still this st they're, they're, they're sort of trying to push a, a community aspect at the moment so there's there's loads of and, and YouTube are doing the same thing actually with their with their community uh, section of the of the platform but um, trying to push polls and and really driving deepening engagement whereas for for the longest time it was all about as, as going as broad as possible things that where the the barrier to entry was as low as possible so that as many people as possible saw the first three seconds whereas now the the focus is is on is on 60 second views and uh and, and trying to trying to reach uh try, trying to deepen that that engagement so uh so yeah behind the scenes, the scenes stuff that does incredibly well from from show accounts but less so less so from uh from channel accounts so uh, for instance if i'm a fan of a particular drama uh, i might be really interested in what happened during the filming of that drama but if i'm uh, if I follow Channel 4, uh, I, it could be because I was very interested in uh, a really great um, uh, dispatches. Um, and now you're showing me some behind the scenes stuff from a drama I've never seen. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult to make things that are incredibly broadly popular. Mm -hmm. So uh, it just needs a bit of thought into how you can uh, make things that are for the right audience. So, yeah. so which, which voice are we speaking in, I suppose? Yeah, and what do you consider when you're yeah trying to speak to an audience for yeah for a show channel versus like the the channel four channel? Yeah, so I mean you you need to look at what's performed well on those uh, on that, from that particular channel in the past. What well, what's the audience? What what is the likely audience that we're going to reach with this? Is there any media spend? Are we are we actually targeting mm -hmm. these people, or are we expecting it to travel organically? And so uh, yeah, you need to look at the, the and the data will tell you what is likely to. To perform well mm. it's there aren't loads of surprises yeah it, do you find though yeah the metrics you're looking at do differ a lot to it to each show or are there certain ones that um across the board you you focus on i mean i could i, I can say with some confidence that if we if we make a, a three minute edit of uh of first dates it's going to do a couple of million views um and uh and and, and that could be any one of the stories in, in a first dates episode so um so that's and, and that's just because it, it continues to perform in the same way mm -hmm. um whereas uh if we're talking about a brand new drama with an unknown cast and uh, and there's, it's never performed particularly well in, uh, it's, it's, it's got no track record. Uh, no one's invested in the programme yet. If we put that stuff out before mm -hmm. uh, it's been on the television, then we're less likely to get a, a, a big lump of engagement. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's a new show, how, yeah, how would you approach, um, I guess, building up that, that audience? Uh, in, in a sort of counterintuitive way, the <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, it, this isn't the, this is, this is not the official party line, but the, 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 the best way to get people interested in that on social is for it to be on television. It's reaching an audience of millions of people. So that it, it's, they're more likely to then engage with that content once it's been out. Um, Certainly finding it helps. I mean, from our perspective, we, we've, we, we find that actually making content for the platform works, but actually, uh, to that very point, actually thinking about what's the hook for people in the first place. So we've just finished a 12-week run of a show with BuzzFeed. They made it for Twitter mm -hmm. called uh, What to Watch. And it was literally a weekly 20 to 30 minute show all about what to watch across the whole of TV. So all the terrestrial channels, uh, yeah, Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime, et cetera, et cetera. And it was made by their TV and, and social media editorial teams. So Brian and uh, Scott and Dion made the show every week. 
And it was, to so the name of the, the panel, it was art meeting science. It was basically a really engaging sort of 20 minute slot. They thought about what's interesting for the audience. And then they pulled in tweets, they pulled in data as part of the editorial of the show. And I think that's just a really great example of using the stimulus of something we've all got in common to make something that's bespoke for a platform. Um, so we launched that at Edinburgh last year, and we've had, I think I've had 800,000 viewers every week on okay. average. And we're looking to be uh, making season two now as well. So I think that's just a really nice example of thinking about the signals you can get from social, mm. but not discarding, you know, the, the, the big uniting things that we kind of all have in common. So Yeah, definitely. Nice. And with that example, what sort of data, yeah, if you, you have visibility into that, yeah. were they using to then, yeah, kind of... Well, they, they were using um, tweet data, so, you know, volumes of tweets about shows. Mm. Obviously, they're looking at viewing data, but they're also looking at what shows were being talked about in advance so they could see, even before shows went out, the anticipation right. around, you know... Killing Eve 2, for example. So they're kind of pulling this in, saying we've had this many tweets about the show, it hasn't launched yet, and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So it's a combination mm -hmm. of, of lots of different sort of data types. But rather than presenting just pure data, because I think they felt that with any, you know, all due respect to any data people in the room, it's not that interesting. Mm -hmm. They were kind of weaving a, a you know, a narrative story around it and kind of going, what, what are you looking forward yeah. to, et cetera, et cetera, and then pulling in tweets and stuff. Yeah, nice. Um, and have you seen, yeah, maybe you've seen this as well with Twitter or any of you guys, but um, yeah, cases where you've been able to use uh, talent that's like digital first and then, yeah, take them onto um, TV shows and, and see them perform successfully? Uh, so yeah, we've got we've got some examples of of finding talent, uh, like Chicken Connoisseur. If anyone's seen the Chicken Connoisseur, and then so uh, he was great. That was a good channel, uh, a YouTube channel. Where if for anyone who didn't didn't see it, um, this guy called Elijah he goes around chicken shops in London and then reviews oh, yeah. them, yeah. Uh, and it's it, and. Uh, like the USP was that the, the 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 graphics were really good, um, really tech <coughs> graphics. Um, but it was, it was so it was fun and it was uh, really like young facing and it was uh, interesting and exciting. And so that got turned into a channel, an E4 show, um, where instead of chicken shops, exclusively chicken shops, he would uh, review trainers or put push bikes or um, kebabs. So, uh, so that and and it was a good show. And again, we ran that on Snapchat, and it reached enormous uh, audiences and uh, really young and loyal audiences. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's interesting. And uh, other, but but then there's other other times where you find uh, talent on on social or, or, or digital platforms, and it doesn't quite translate. And and I think the difference the the difference seems to be where we've where we've made sort of features around YouTube talent, like there was a Casper and Joe thing a, a few years ago, which was basically just a a, a, a TV show about them because they were famous YouTubers. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think what we weren't adding, what wasn't added was what was missing from the TV mm -hmm. show. Like if, it, 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 you can't really hope that people are gonna all like they've got 20 million subscribers on YouTube. They're not all going to come and watch the the TV show just because you've made it and they're in it. Um, like we 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 could have probably known that because at least uh, 19 million of those subscribers are probably not in the UK, mm -hmm. and we're only making this for a UK audience. So that's in, and then yeah. not all of them are going to see the advertising because we're only telling them about it on, on places where they're not watching, mm -hmm. maybe. So. Um, so, uh, but uh, we, we're we're increasingly working with uh, w with new and interesting uh, social and digital talent. With some of the some of the original content that we're making, there's um, uh, Sparks is an interesting yeah. thing um, where uh, 120 pieces of original uh, social content were, were commissioned as part of a new um, a new program. Um, it's comedy content, um, and it's n n uh, it's sort of I think 60% of it is from outside of London mm -hmm. um, so that's that's good uh, and so all of the all of the talent has been sourced through and, and they're all sort of uh, social digital native producers mm -hmm. as well so it's uh, it's it's that we should start seeing that from September mm -hmm. um, published from Channel 4 E4 <laughs> mm -hmm. 
uh, places. Yeah. yeah, nice. And I guess with that first example where, you know, there, there was a lot of success there, how, how do you feel like that is then perceived internally now at Channel 4? Is there, yeah, at a senior level, are people more interested in sort of, yeah, not just, I guess, taking um, digital talent and bring that into shows, but, yeah, getting ideas or testing IP for, for shows on? Without doubt, we've got, the, I mean, it's a, it's a real opportunity to... Um, uh, to pilot programs on effectively, so the the hope with the Sparks content that's, that's going to start coming out is that um, we we make some funny stuff, publish it on on the internet, and then people watch it. We get proof that that's a good thing to make, and then develop that into a into a linear television program, or maybe it gets developed into a into a digital property of its own. Who knows where it goes? But but the, if there's proof that there's an audience for it, then we grow that audience and then develop the the property. Um, do you think though that? Oh, sorry, I know you're answering the question. Yeah, no. um, But do you think that that's happening fast enough? Because my no. observation, because the social seems social video seems to work at its own speed, you know, brutally fast. It's like, it's like speed yeah. boats, you know. And often TV channels are perceived as these kind of oil tankers are much slower to turn around. Yeah. And it's good to hear about you know chicken connoisseur. But I, I, my observation is that there's so much more opportunity there for TV channels because yeah. But how how do you do that? How do you square that circle and yeah. actually go? You know, we've just got to make stuff more quickly and, and well, yes. Yeah. So there's uh, so when people are spending a, a lot more money uh, because yeah. like linear tariffs are higher. So when you spend when the investment's higher, people care more about it. I yeah. think people are more careful about it. So yes, timing is a really important thing. Uh, also, like we're not doing enough of them. Yeah. Uh, for every one that does well, there's going to be nine or ten that don't. So right. we need to in, we need to do more of it faster. Yeah. And that's that's difficult when like we've only got so much money to spend. Sure. So you, what do you prioritize? Especially when we're not going to earn as much from uh, from publishing that that digital only social only content when we could be earning. Loads more by put, by making the money, uh, making the content for mm -hmm. for telly. So it's it's a different. I think it's happening. The 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 change is happening. It's just it's it's difficult to to yeah. force it to go faster. Yeah. And have you seen Alex Endmore then? I guess examples. Yeah, of where you've been taking like great digital talent, and that's been working well for certain certain projects. Uh, not necessarily. I think that there was kind of people almost wanted to distance them, themselves away from that um, at, at one time or another. I'm, I'm not quite sure that what that was, but I think there were some examples where people didn't necessarily make that, that really clean jump from, from the, the digital space into TV. Um, but from an Endemol Shine perspective, um, we've got uh, one of the kind of biggest uh, internet properties, so uh, Mr. Bean. Um, we've got around 100 million sort of cross-platform followers. Um, it's absolutely huge uh, property for us. Um, we just recently <laughs> awarded the diamond play button and uh, Rowan Atkinson actually went along and collected that on our behalf, which was great. And um, when you have such a big channel and such a like, highly engaged audience, it's really, really difficult, particularly with a television program, which was first on there, I think, in 1990. And I think there's only around 10 hours worth of content, um, sort of in total. Um, it's, it's quite the challenge for our sort of uh, our, our, our social teams to be able to chop that up and re-edit it and, and, and sort of make it new and interesting uh, each each week or each day. Um, so we've uh, come up with a couple of interesting ways that we can we, we can kind of come up with new content. Um, one of them is kind of like a sort of a hands in pans, um, so to speak, style of. Um, video where we've got green screen of Rowan um, cut with our head of kids and uh, entertainment's hands wearing the official uh, Mr Bean jacket um, and then just doing silly stuff um, and, and that, that's kind of messy hands is what we call that. And then also um, there's a big, big audience for us for uh, Mr Bean the Animator series but again we have the same issue where there isn't enough content uh, to exploit. Um, so uh, we've actually um, created our own um, first in-house animation production called PC Bob, which is very, very similar in style and feel to Mr. Bean the Animated Series. And we've kind of just taken that audience, which is there, and then started posting Mr. Bean, uh, sorry, not Mr. Bean, PC Bob um, episodes on those Mr. Bean channels. And there's been a, a 
big levels of engagement there. And now we're on, I think, the, the second series of that. And um, we're hoping that that actually make, may make the jump uh, as a format to linear. Um, so nice. lots of and exciting things. How are you measuring the success then of, yeah, of that with like PC Bob where it's kind of a newer... Well, I just think that uh, interactions, comments, views, um, the, the amount of time people spend on the platform as well, um, and sort of audience retention rates. But um, yeah, all of the kind of um, metrics sort of all add up at the moment, so it works quite well for us. Does there have to be a like a, an ROI point in there, though? Would you just keep doing it if it wasn't earning you any money, but you were getting loads of likes? <sighs> yeah, I mean, that, that's a, it's a good question. Um, I think the, the, the sheer size and scale of the, of the Mr. Bean feed and actually the amount of revenue that it does generate for us, um, we really do need to have um, some sort of new content on there to, to keep that, um, that fan base satisfied. So, yeah, that does, does work for us at the moment, but that might change in the future. Yeah. Great, and then I want to make sure we have time to talk about this from like a sales perspective as well, Nikki. So, um, yeah, it'd be good to know how, yeah, how measurement and the role of, of data has changed for you when it, yeah, it comes to more like commercial pitching and yeah, talking about some of the, the projects you're working on. Yeah, so um, international broadcasters always want to know overnights. Uh, that's very important to them, but that's only one small picture, part of the picture. So we use three measurements. It's the overnights, it's the talkability, the buzz that's going on around the programme or the talent that's featured in it. Um, and then it's also the critical acclaim, you know, the reviews. That all helps with our, our pitch to international broadcasters. Great. And yeah, I guess then with sort of social video data, like specific data, do you think that could play an increasing role in, in commercial pitching? Or yeah, I think, I think so. There, there think, could be more of an appetite. I think so, because I think over, traditional overnights aren't as accurate as the big picture. So I, I think there's definitely time for change to, yeah. to increase the correct information that we're going to pitch to other broadcasters. Mm -hmm. Marketing teams like big numbers as well. Yeah. So that's one of the beauties of sort of these, these digital metrics is you can talk in the billions instead of yeah. the millions. And particularly as kind of overnight ratings, traditional linear ratings have fallen, uh, people want to see growth. So there's always, there's always a nice growth story in yeah. digital. So it works well for us. I know if we were looking to uh, make some kind of uh, like spin out content, some, some supporting content, let's use... Uh, uh, goggle box if we wanted to do an additional piece of content that was for uh, for a social platform but was branded then the fact that goggle box content has performed incredibly well on social would definitely help us attract a sponsor for it mm -hmm. um, and that's got to be the same, same for thing us yeah you, absolutely right? yeah. yeah it's that buzz around that content and predictability of performance as well mm. yeah, yeah. Great. All right. Well, I think that's, yeah, we're almost at, at time. But um, yeah, I want to thank you guys for, yeah, kind of sharing some of your thoughts and uh, work you've been been doing recently with us. Um, in terms of like, yeah, what we've spoken about today. So uh, we're actually running a, a session tomorrow. It's like a lightning workshop uh, really to look at some recommendations Tubular have around how to, how to leverage data, whether it's, yeah, to inform commissioning, it's to actually build a community online, um, yeah, or, or to test new IP. So, um, I think that's 10.30 tomorrow in the, the uh, area over there. So feel free to join that. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for coming, guys. Thank you so much.